Good morning, and thank you all for being here. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we learn, work, and play on Treaty 7, Treaty 6, Treaty 8, and Métis ancestral lands, the gathering place of many Indigenous peoples. This is where we strive to honour and respect our relationship with one another through meaningful reconciliation. I'm very pleased to be here today to announce an important initiative that embodies our commitment to fostering a justice system that is not only fair and accessible, but also deeply rooted in the values and culture of the diverse communities here in Alberta. Over the course of the last several months, we have engaged with Albertans across the province, and one thing is clear. Many Albertans are interested in resolving legal matters within their communities rather than visiting a courtroom. And so, today I am proud to announce that we are investing $1.2 million to help empower organizations to explore and develop in innovative community justice initiatives. Through the Alberta Community Justice Grant, we will be providing funds for community-based organizations to increase their capacity, create new tools and processes, and conduct training and research they need to make community justice an even more attractive and accessible option to Albertans. I believe that Albertans deserve a fair and accessible justice system. And community justice programs have proven to be an innovative and very popular alternative to the formal court system which some Albertans can find impersonal and intimidating. The Alberta Community Justice Grant is more than just financial support. It is an investment in the capacity and effectiveness of community-based organizations. Understanding the landscape of community justice is vital. The Alberta Community Justice Grant provides a unique opportunity for organizations to build or enhance their community justice initiatives ensuring that our justice system is not only fair, but also accessible to Albertans from corner to corner. Eligible products under the Community Justice Grant could include things like partnerships with community stakeholders, the development of essential tools, training resources and research efforts, and training programs or technical support. Community-based organizations can apply for one-time funding ranging between $5,000 to a maximum of $25,000. By working together, we can build a justice system that truly reflects the values of Albertans, ensuring fairness and accessibility to justice for all. By engaging community members in the decision-making process to address the root causes of crime, this new grant aims to build safer and stronger communities through community involvement, prevention programs, and alternative approaches to justice. I will now take the opportunity to invite Denise Blair, Founder and Executive Director of Calgary Youth Justice Society, for her remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this announcement of a grant to support alternatives to the justice system for Albertans. Over the past 25 years, Calgary Youth Justice Society has successfully helped to divert almost 15,000 young people facing less serious criminal charges away from court and into a community program. This is where volunteers from youth justice committees in Calgary and across Alberta help young people to make amends for their actions, access needed resources, and are supported to contribute in a positive way to their community. <clears throat> we have experienced firsthand the incredible impact that results when caring adult volunteers work together with young people, their families, and victims to repair harm, and to see and nurture the innate strengths in each young person to help them realize their full potential. This grassroots restorative approach is accessible, and effective with immediate and long-lasting benefits for young people, their families, our justice system, and the community. The overwhelming majority of young people make the most of this second chance on a bad decision. More than 90% successfully complete the program by making an apology and restitution to victims, volunteering, and participating in programs to help them onto a better path. 
One year following their involvement, we also know that more than 90% of these young people have stayed out of the justice system. Instead, without a criminal charge or conviction to hold them back, they are pursuing education and employment opportunities that may not have been available to them otherwise. There are benefits to our justice system as well. Last year in Calgary alone, 327 young people were diverted to youth justice committees. If charged and dealt with in court, it could have meant upwards of 1,000 appearances for youth, their parents and guardians, in addition to valuable time and resources required of our justice system. Nonprofits like organizations like Calgary Youth Justice Society rely on donations and investments like this grant to ensure that we can all work together to build a safer community for everyone. Thank you, Denise. I will now invite Yusuf Ali, the board chairperson, Horn of Africa Educational and Economic Development Society, to provide remarks. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Yusuf Ali, and I'm here representing uh, the uh, Horn of Africa Educational and Economic Development Society. And I thank to the Minister of Justice for giving us this uh, opportunity to voice our interest in settling uh, legal issues or matters out of courts. And our organization has a mandate, which is to provide culturally appropriate services to this community. So since it is inception, we have been uh, providing health awareness, uh, education, and just awareness too. And we do other services for the newcomers, which who are very new in the community or in the country. And recently we were involved with uh, a restorative justice program that's owned by our community, which is called Garsor Community. And Garsor Community is, is a Somali word, which means in English, putting things right. So this current funding, we welcome because it is moving forward, uh, bringing um, justice to the community, close to the community, and give us more access to the communities who are very new in this country, or the indigenous people too. So I would like to uh, voice here our support for this investment, for this new funding which is a commitment of bringing people, bringing uh, justice to the uh, community. And I'm here anyway to answer any questions to you are, have to ask me, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yusuf. I will now invite Diane Lowe, the board chairperson, sorry, Diane Lowe for her remark. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here and really welcome the um, news that has been released today by Minister Amory about um, this grant that is really going to fill um, a need across the province. Over the past decade, Alberta's Reforming the Family Justice System initiative has been working to reimagine family justice and over the past three years has been engaging with collaborators from across many sectors in Grand Prairie to explore how that kind of change can be supported. The RFJS is based on the evidence of brain science, resilience and the adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. This science has helped us to understand that the toxic stress arising from an adversarial approach to family matters has negative consequences for parents and their children. Brain science confirms not only the impact of ACEs on future health and social outcomes, but also the ability to build resilience and buffer the effects of toxic stress through supports and skills building for families and children.
So we're seeking to reduce the reliance on adversarial legal responses in courts and to increase the community's capacity to support families who are restructuring. The support will equip families with the skills they need to communicate well, make decisions about the well-being of their children, be at the forefront, and will assist families with all of the social relationship, parenting, financial, and health issues that are really at the heart of family matters. In order to create different pathways and support well-being, we need to engage the whole community. Communities such as Grand Prairie, which has become a demonstration community for the RFJS, are exploring new approaches and pathways to family justice and creating a model that can be scaled across the province. The funding available through the Alberta Community Justice Grant will assist all Alberta communities, including Grand Prairie, to continue to explore innovative and transformational approaches to support families to reduce their reliance on adversarial legal processes. We're exploring a number of possible prototypes or pilots, including a restorative justice approach to domestic violence situations, an online application for divorce based on a model in Denmark, and a court pilot that limits the cases that are dealt with in courts while referring families to the kind of community-based social relationship, parenting, financial, and health supports they need, as well as programs to build skills. Funding such as the Alberta Justice Community Grant will enable the RFJS and the community to bring together government, private and nonprofit service providers to ensure that the supports and skills that families need to assist with their social relationship, parenting, financial and health issues are ready and available in their communities. This will help families to access and experience justice as they build resilience and then to achieve better outcomes. While the financial investment is much needed to empower this cross-sector engagement, capacity building, the coordination of services, creation of tools, training, evaluation, and learning from these new approaches, we believe it also symbolizes support for the transformational change to a family justice system where families will thrive. Thanks. Thank you very much. And that concludes the formal portion of this news conference. We'll now move to question and answer, starting in the room before we move over to the phone lines. Media are invited to ask one question, please, and one follow-up. Um, question in the room. Yeah, Minister, what are you doing to address the backlog of public fatality inquiries, and when will these changes be put in place? We are, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we are uh, <coughs> reviewing the Fatality Inquiries Act as we speak. We are uh, working with department officials to identify the deficiencies. We are going to likely be introducing some changes to help address these issues very shortly in the future. And I can tell you that we are very much on top of dealing with these things. We're well aware of them. And uh, we're going to do everything that we can to address those backlogs and make sure that we, uh, we introduce changes to help address and make it more efficient families waiting in limbo? Well, I would say that uh, first and foremost, I'm very sympathetic to some of these uh, things that um, families are experiencing. I know that it is a tremendous challenge to um, have to go through a very difficult process and uh, just want to assure all the families here in Alberta that we are working very hard to address these, uh, these backlogs as quickly as possible. Thank you. Any more questions in the room? We we'll now move over to the phone lines. Um, operator, could you please put through the first caller? Lisa Johnson, Post Media. Hi, thanks for taking my question. This is for the minister, and I apologize it's a little bit off topic, but I'm curious to hear from you after um, we heard yesterday a, a group of human rights organizations and press freedom organizations uh, made a public call for charges against a journalist named Brandy Morin to be dropped after she was arrested by Edmonton police during an encampment clearing. Um, and so I'm wondering um, whether you're considering or if you've ever considered any policy changes um, on a provincial level for police in Alberta when they're interacting with journalists to reflect recent court decisions that have found that exclusion zones are unlawful. Look, uh, thank you for your question. I, I want to stress the, um, the, the concept that we operate within uh, the premise that police are able to conduct their, their job independently of any political influence. Um, certainly we respect 
the decisions of police officers in, in the very stressful and particular circumstances that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. That being said, uh, we will continue to ensure that police and uh, prosecution services operate independently of any political influence. Uh, we will assess uh, situations as they come and as they arise, but at this time, I think that uh, the police and prosecutorial independence is absolutely paramount, and that's the way it's going to be. Do you have a follow-up question, Lisa? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I, I guess just on a basic level, I'm wondering what your interpretation of the law is. Uh, are exclusion zones um, being used by police to control the movement of journalists, do you believe that that is lawful or unlawful? And, and to be clear, I'm not asking you to comment directly on the case, just just that policy note. What's your interpretation of that? Well, generally speaking, I think that, you know, police have to assess a situation uh, as they come. Every situation is different. Every situation poses unique challenges, unique issues. And uh, once again, uh, I can't comment on a uh, particular issue, as you mentioned, but I can certainly say to you that uh, we will uh, we, we allow police uh, to do their jobs. We allow our prosecution service to do their jobs. Uh, if there is a need for a broad policy to come into place, certainly we will assess it as it comes. But in this particular instance, I think that uh, we're going to continue to allow uh, police to, to assess situations independently. I can't comment on one broad sweeping uh, idea in, in relation to, to one issue or one encounter. And so I would simply leave you with this. Uh, police uh, can and will be able to, enter, um, to exercise their, their discretion uh, in, in the situations that arise as they see fit. If there is a need to assess a broad scope or policy change, then we'll certainly uh, look at that when, it, when and if it arises. Operator, could you please put through the next caller, please? There are no other questions in the queue at this time. All right. Thank you, everyone. That concludes our press conference. Have a great day. Thank you all for coming.